Well, thank you, Beth. I appreciate the opportunity to be presenting today on electrical safety. My name is Gary Larkins, and I want to thank you for participating in the presentation today. We're going to spend some time today going over electrical safety, and we're going to just touch on a few subjects that are important for electrical safety. So in looking at the uh, agenda today, hang on here as I get the, the agenda up. Today we're going to provide an introduction to electrical shock and arc flash hazards. We're going to discuss exposure to hazards, introduce to you a few of the OSHA requirements for safety, and introduce you to NFPA 70E standard for electrical safety in the workplace. We're also going to discuss steps to reduce risk of injury. Now please note some of these slides may contain graphic materials. And this presentation is not an electrical safety training course, but the purpose is to help develop awareness of potential hazards, introduce steps to reduce safety hazards and reduce injury, and re review industry standards and mandates that are applicable to electrical safety. So a complete electrical safety training program for folks that are doing electrical work would typically take at least eight hours. And sometimes we have 12 or, or 14 hour classes as well. By the way, I also wanted to just let you know as well, all PGE seminars and webinars are part, in part sponsored by the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. These organizations work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations you learn in the events are consistent across all the individual programs and services. So again, thanks to our sponsors today. So a little bit of background on myself. I'm not going to read all the text on this uh, this slide, but I am going to tell you I am passionate about electrical safety. Uh, over 20 some years ago, uh, I got hung up on electricity. There was a wiring error and I was working on some wiring, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I actually got stuck on electricity. I got hung up on a ceiling until uh, I passed out and fell eight feet to the concrete. Okay, so that day was one of the most painful days of my life. I've never ever, I've broken bones, I've snapped tendons, done things in my life, but never ever had that kind of pain before in my life. And I stayed up there till I passed out. Uh, the doctor, later that day, when I went in to, uh, to get checked out, the doctor said the bounce off the concrete was good for me because the, uh, the bounce off the concrete is probably what restarted my heart based on the EKG. So I've been involved with electrical shock, uh, almost electrocution, and I've had several arc flash events occur because of damaged or defective equipment that I've been working on in the past. So again, I have a passion for your electrical safety and your avoidance of the risk of injury and the hazards. So what I'd like you to do right now is just tell us a little bit about yourself. So if you tell me a little bit about yourself here, um, if you could use your arrow here or your marker here and just mark again where where maybe when you look at this, if you could mark what industry so that you're from or a little bit about your job function, that would be helpful. So I see we have quite a few people from facilities here. You know, we have some folks from, we have someone here from environmental health and safety, um, some engineering and consulting, okay? So this is good. I appreciate this, the feedback here as uh, we're seeing people. So quite a few folks from the engineering consulting from facilities and from environmental health and safety. So thank you for participating today. So we're gonna start by touching on electrical hazards and potential impacts of those hazards. When we look at electricity, typically exposed energized electrical equipment doesn't look or sound intimidating or threatening. So when we talk about this, in other words, if, if I go outside and I look at an overhead power line, up in the upper right-hand corner, you see some overhead power lines, it doesn't sound threatening. Uh, if we know electricity, we know that that could be very hazardous or it can even cause death if we not only make contact but come too close with a conductive object or even something that's not insulated for the voltage involved, such as a tree branch or a two by four. So we have, con we have overhead power lines. We look at the middle picture there and we see that we have uh, energized electrical equipment there. So we can see right here, we have energized electrical equipment right here in the middle and on the lower left hand corner we also see that we have we have electrical it's a transformer it's called a unit substation now the lower left hand corner there you can see that everything's enclosed i mean that's its normal enclosure but if you look closely on the top and bottom you'll see that there's vent holes in there so those vent holes even though the equipment's all closed up 
the probability or the risk of, of an accident or incident occurring is probably much lower because nobody's working inside. But we've had sites before where there's been, uh, whether it be a rat or contamination inside the gear or a defect, where there's been an electrical explosion, and that electrical explosion actually came out through the vent holes. In the one case uh, in particular, nobody was burned, fortunately, because people were down at the other end of the room. But there have been cases where people are, have been burned. The key thing is here is to always treat res with respect and follow safe work practices, whether we're opening up gear or whether we're around electrical gear. Now, on the lower left-hand corner, we're talking about that unit substation, that transformer. Now, it's, the risk is probably very low that something's going to occur right when someone's maybe walking past. But in many electrical rooms on construction sites or remodels, we'll find that maybe a contractor puts their print table there or the break room, or we'll find folks going into the electrical room to make that their break room. So what am I doing to the probability of, of the risk of injury when I'm having somebody stand or sit in front of that gear for a half hour, maybe an hour at a time? It goes way up. So what is your policy around allowing folks or being into electrical areas allowing to go into electrical areas where we have the potential exposure. So in the middle picture here, where I look here, again, I open up that cabinet and that's 277 volts. You see the three bus bars there. That's a bus bar right there. Over here is a grounded surface. 277 volts on that bus bar to ground, 480 volts phase to phase. Now, if anything, you might just hear a little hum, but yet it doesn't sound intimidating. Now, con contrast that with if I was to, let's say, I had a neighbor that uh, needed me to go to the drugstore and bring them some medicine. They couldn't go get their medicine. And I go down to their house, and I put my hand on the fence to open up the fence gate to get into their house to bring the medicine to them. And I had a couple large you know, dogs that came up to me, and they looked at me like I was lunch, and they were barking and growling. Would I just walk into that yard and open up that gate? Absolutely not. I'd call the owner and find out a way to get that source, potential source of hazardous energy controlled. In other words, I would understand the threat. I would understand the possible impacts. But yet, how many times do we treat electricity in the same manner? That's a question that deserves to be asked because I'll tell you, many people in my classes will tell me they don't think of it that way. They open up the cabinets and equipment, and they're not necessarily thinking about the hazards. They're thinking about troubleshooting. In some cases, they're distracted about the big game. So again, we need to have ways that we focus our attention on the potential hazards and the risk of injury. So let's look at some of those hazards. The National Safety Council, approximately 30,000 non-fatal shock injuries each year. Approximately 1,000 fatalities occur each year due to electrocution, over half of them while servicing energized systems less than 600 volts. If you keep up with uh, kind of what's going on in the industry, there's still a lot of people that are getting electrocuted, getting shocked, in the industry, even with a greater focus on electrical safe work practices. Electrocution is actually the sixth leading cause of industrial fatalities. Now on the upper right hand corner of the picture there shows a gentleman working on a, a circuit for lighting. Hopefully that's de-energized, but a lot of people actually just get hurt or injured or even killed working on lighting circuits because it's a pretty common thing that people will go up and work up on a ceiling on lighting circuits. And that shouldn't be common. There's no justification for working on a lighting circuit energized. Down here, the picture below it, we can see this is actually electrical contact burn, where someone has actually been burned by having electrical contact with the electrical system here. And you can see right there on their hands. Again, I apologize, but this is the PG-13, part of the PG-13 here. But this is an electrical contact burn where someone's hand has been burned. Now, this was not from an arc flash, but from someone making contact in the electrical current flowing through their body and actually cooking parts of their body. Now, if you have, what is your policy? If someone gets shocked, do you ask them to go get checked out medically, get professional medical advice and to get checked out? We've had several cases where people have been shocked and hours later or into the evening, they passed away because of the after effects of shock. In some cases, it could be, you know, their heart got out of rhythm, which we'll talk about here shortly. So when we look at shock hazards, when we look at it takes very little current flow and very little voltage in many cases to cause that current to flow. Some people, when we look at uh, having wet hands or cuts or scrapes on our hands, as little as 30 volts can cause enough current to flow to get us around 
50, 60 milliamps of current flow, which we'll look at here. Now, a lot of times though, 120 volts, um, 277 volts are pretty common exposures that we work on in the industry, 480 volts. Okay, so you can see if as little as 30 volts under the right conditions can cause issues. And by the way, OSHA and NFPA 70 generally look at the risk of injury. Generally about 50 volts is their threshold where they're really focusing on enough current to flow to cause some significant injuries. So when we look at this, the shock hazards, 0 0.001 amps, just a faint tingle. 5 milliamps, that's 0 0.005 amps, slight shock felt, disturbing but not painful. Most people can let go, however, strong and voluntary movements can cause injuries. By the way, the ground fault circuit interrupters that you use on temporary power cords, those little GFCIs, or that you've seen around your kitchen sinks, they have the push to test and the reset buttons on them, kitchen sinks, bathroom sinks, outdoors, and so forth that are required when doing construction type activities on, on project sites, and they're required in many places in residences and other locations, rooftops on commercial buildings and industrial buildings. Any place where we have water and we have electricity, those do not mix well. Okay, a typical trip threshold for a GFCI receptacle is four to six milliamps. So you can see it's still slight shock felt, but again, it's there to trip and help prevent electrical shock that causes severe injury or death. So when we look at six to 25 milliamps for women, nine to 30 milliamps for men, we have painful shock, muscular control is lost. This is where freezing currents start. Now we're not talking about freezing like it's getting cold outside. We're talking about your muscles lock up. So in other words, if you get connected, you may not be able to let go, just like I couldn't let go when I was up in that ceiling. I got stuck on the electricity until I passed out and fell to the concrete. 50 to 150 milliamps, extremely painful shock. Respiratory arrest, in other words, especially if the current is flowing through your chest, it can actually lock up your chest muscles, okay, and you can stop breathing. Severe muscle contractions, your flexor muscles may cause holding on, your extensor muscles may cause intense pushing away, which could be a good thing if you're pushing yourself away from the electricity, a bad thing if you fall off the ladder and hit your head and, and have a head injury or worse yet. And 1,000 to 4,300 milliamps or 1 to 4.3 amps, we have ventricular fibrillation, your heart can be out of rhythm. Now, that partially depends on the length of the exposure and the pathway for the exposure. If it's going through your chest, of course, it's gonna be much worse than if it's going between two fingers. And we can see down there, 10 amps, cardiac arrest and severe burns occur, death is probable. We're up above, death was likely, but now death is probable. And in a standard residence, we haven't even tripped the 15 amp breaker, the standard 15 amp breaker, if I don't have GFCI protection. Now, in a, in a commercial building, generally, our circuits are usually the minimum or 20 amp circuits. So you can see there's no way that we're going to blow the circuit breaker before we cause possible severe injury or death. So when we look at electrical shock and exposure, those who perform work on or near energized equipment are exposed, okay, so may have exposure, and those who use electrical tools, equipment, or appliances. Now, shock can occur at home, work, or play. In the lower left-hand corner here, we see that we have the a bus bar here where we have exposed bus bar. If someone's working in that cabinet and they make contact, and they may not even have to make direct contact. In some cases, electricity, depending on the voltage level, can actually reach across an air, air gap and actually arc over to your body. The next picture over here, we see someone using portable, a portable drill, power drill. A lot of times, defective cords, defective tools, defective... Uh, receptacles or installations can cause hazards. A lot of people get shocked and or killed on using portable cords and tools. Again, that's why OSHA, the OSHA requirement for GFCI protection for construction type activities in the workplace and the mandates for the National Electrical Codes to use GFCI protection in residences and buildings. Okay, so here we have an adjustable speed drive. Anytime we have an adjustable speed drive or we have, let's say, a photovoltaic, the next picture over here, we have new technologies. When we have new technologies, in many cases, we have folks entering in the industry that are being trained on these, but they may not have years of experience working on them. Anytime we have people that are just learning or starting out, even though they've been trained, the, the newer they are in the industry or the less experience they have, the more likely it is that they can receive an electrical shock or some type of injury. So again, shock can occur at home, work, or at play. 
I could give you story after story of people getting shocked in swimming pools, people getting shocked at home with power cords or tools, and people getting shocked and or electrocuted at work. So proper selection, installation, and use of maintenance is very important for equipment and you need to use as per the safety agency listing. In other words, if you have a table lamp that's listed to use on a table, you don't take it outside and put it where it's wet. That's not a proper use of listing. Same type of if you have a large transformer that's not designed to be outside where it's wet, again, you can't use it outside because that's not within the safety agency listing. On the lower left-hand corner here, we actually have, this is actually from a bike path in Eastern Oregon where I rode up upon this, and you can see the, the junction box there is broken. So there is no equipment grounding path back, which we'll take a look at that in just a minute. But in other words, if that wiring, if the insulation there gets skinned, that whole section of raceway here to the right, this J box and the whole section of raceway would actually become energized. And there is actually a pole light that would become energized right along a bike pathway where kids ride and where they play. The picture up to the right here, we see that there's a damaged cord. Okay, right there we can see the cord is damaged or insulated. If someone picks that up or it's sitting in water, we could have electrical current flow. Just below it here, we have another damaged cord where the insulation is pulling out. And in the upper right-hand corner here, we can see that we're missing a ground pin here on our cord. So in essence, we've lost our safety ground, which can definitely cause problems when we look at the use of portable cords and tools. Many people have been electrocuted because the safety ground is missing. It's absolutely essential we inspect our cords and tools and use them properly. We can also have contact with overhead power lines or get close enough to the overhead power lines. So Oregon OSHA and Federal OSHA give us guidance. Uh, generally, they'll tell us to stay a minimum of 10 foot away from the power lines, not only with our body, but with anything that could be conductive. What are we talking about there? Well, a two by four can, or a tree branch can be conductive. If we get close enough, it's not insulated for the voltage involved. I'm gonna ask you to, to check out the Oregon OSHA or the Federal OSHA working clearances on there and to make sure that both your folks, whether you're at work or at home, and if you have kids or grandkids or significant others or spouses, please make them aware of the distances from power lines. A lot of people are hurt or killed every year across the U.S. because they do not understand those distances. I'm going to ask you to consider staying at least 20 foot away. Now, don't take a tape measure out there and try and measure how far away you are from the power line, okay, because then you will, you will experience the problem with getting too close to the power line. So if you want to kind of gauge it, if you could stick your hands out to your sides, straight out to your sides, kind of like your, what I would call your wing spread, if you think about that, you – your wing spread is about the same as your height. So let's say you're um, six foot. So if you take four of these lengths, if you can kind of gauge in your mind what would be four of these lengths away from the power line, again, don't get close to, to measure it, but just kind of use an estimation, a minimum of four of your arm lengths away from any overhead power line. Please also see the PGE safety webpage on electrical safety, and I've given you the link down below. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a slide with some additional links, and Beth will be sending out the links in the presentation today as well. But please teach those that you know, please teach those that you care about, and teach your employees that, that work with you or other coworkers and so forth about overhead line safety. It may save their life. So I'd like a little feedback here. How many times have you been shocked? Could you use your tools again on the uh, left-hand side there to maybe mark in here how many times you've been shocked? Okay, so we see um, some folks have never been shocked up here. That's awesome, great. So you've never experienced it. Um, some of our live presentations I offer during break to, to help folks understand shock. We're going to, you know, hook them up. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. But it's, it can be very, very painful. But I see some folks here once, twice, and uh, three times. Uh, nobody's been stuck on electrical circuit. Thank goodness. Of course, they may not be around even uh, to be on the presentation if they were stuck on electrical circuit. But one of the things you can see from this is that we have several people that have been stuck on electricity or been shocked, excuse me, not stuck, but shocked three times or maybe even more. Now the next time, maybe the last time, 
In other words, the next time may be the time that you get stuck on electricity. So it's very important we take the appropriate measures to avoid shock. Otherwise, we may not be here or we may experience a serious injury. Thanks again for that feedback. I appreciate it. So now let's talk a little bit about arc flash hazards. Okay, so we look at an arc flash. Okay, so five to ten arc flash explosions occur in electrical equipment every day in the U.S. Five to ten. When I first saw that statistic, um, I was curious, is that really that high? But now having been, been in the industry and been teaching on safety for oh, probably about the last uh, 12, 14 years here, I would say yes. Okay, this picture, by the way, in the upper right-hand corner is a picture from a friend of mine in Ohio, has a maintenance business, and he just went in and opened up a 600-amp fusible disconnect, and he opened it up and it arced, and the door was closed when it arced, but there was an electrical explosion. When we talk about arc flash, that's an electrical explosion. Okay, so the arc blew around the edges of the door, burned a hole through the door, and blew the door open. Now, he did receive some burns, okay? Now, when we look at this, we say, well, the door was closed. How could he receive injury? Because the electrical gear is not always rated to contain the arc. In fact, it is not rated. It's not tested to contain an arc. In some cases where we have low energy levels, it may contain the arc. In other cases, it may not. This was a 800 or a 600 amp fusible disconnect, but it had, it was on the upstream side of that fuse. It was a 1200 amp board switchboard, and it had almost 50,000 amps of fault current, which meant it had a lot of energy there that it had to release when a fault occurred, okay, that was released. So again, we can see electrical explosions occur. So when we look at arc flash and arc blast, because it is an explosion, not only do we have the flash with the heat wave, but we also have the blast, in many cases a blast pressure wave. So arcing faults release dangerous levels of radiant heat energy capable of causing severe burns or fatal injuries. Okay, arcing can, can cause your, when the arc comes out, we can see clothing ignition. We can see if we have clothing that is like cotton polyester or nylon, it can actually not only catch on fire, but it can burn and melt to your skin, which is beyond PG-13 to talk about the procedure on how they, how they actually take that off your skin. They actually actually have to take a layer of skin off with that. So we have the, the arc blast, the vaporization of metal and the heating of air produces blast pressure waves up to 2,000 PSI, so that's pounds per square inch. So if we have a, a larger arc flash event, we can actually receive internal injuries from the blast pressure wave. In other words, the blast pressure wave may blow us back, we may fall on something, we may fall off a ladder, or we could also just receive internal injuries and or, in some cases, death. So we can see a fatality. The explosion distributes the molten metal produced by the arc over a large area. So just standing to the side, if we have a lot of energy, won't protect you, or possibly just putting a lab coat on when the arc blows down underneath that lab coat. Now, when we look at personal protective equipment for shock and arc blast, it helps provide protection against burn injury, but does nothing against bodily damage due to the blast pressure wave. So we also can have other injuries, including hearing loss, of course, we have an explosion, we have the big sound wave, the big boom. Lung damage, if you get the wind knocked out of you and you try and inhale and you're surrounded by hot flaming gases, you can, you can see what might happen there. Damage to eyesight, I had one gentleman that was involved with an arc flash, didn't have the right PPE on, they had it there, they, he just didn't wear it, wasn't aware of really why he needed to wear it. Okay, now the whole world, when he looks at the world, his face and his eye, eyes were burned, the whole world looks as if he, if you were to tip your head back and shake a pepper shaker on it, that's how he described how he sees the world now. It's full of black spots, and he may not be able to keep his eyesight for the rest of his life. He lost his eyesight for a while, gained part of it back, only works part days now, and he said he would do anything to go back and turn back the hands of time. So when we look at the temperature of an arc flash, this is hot stuff. Arc terminals, this is actually measured in labs, such as a Merson Labs has an arc testing lab, Connectric, several arc testing labs, okay, that are available to do the arc testing. They measure the temperature at the arc source, 35,000 degrees, versus the surface of the sun at 9,000 degrees. Now, I'm not sure who took that measurement. One of the classes I was uh, teaching at said it was an apprentice, and they've never seen him since. Now, I know that's not true, but just seems kind of funny, so I guess to some people at least. So metal droplets coming off the arc, 
we could see it burning upwards of 1,800 degrees, the metal droplets, the superheated metal. Clothing ignition, if that, that heat hits your clothing, between 700 and 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, your clothing can catch on fire. And burning clothing can burn upwards of 1,400 degrees. Now compare that to with what your skin can handle. A curable burn for a tenth of a second, 145 degrees. Cell death, 205 degrees. Is there a big difference there in the, the heat that's coming off the arc and with what your skin can handle? Absolutely. This is why it's absolutely essential we pay attention to arc flash and to protecting yourself and or your personnel against arc flash hazards. So a few of the causes of arc flash hazards include worker error. So sometimes we all make mistakes. I look around, there's body shops all around town. People may have driven for 20 some years. I have some people say, well, I've, I've done this for 20 some years. We can make a mistake tomorrow. We all make mistakes. And if we just look at our driving record or, or track record driving, we could probably all admit that we've driven through an intersection only to look in the rearview mirror to say, was that light red or green? Or was there a stop sign there? Okay. Damaged equipment. I've had several cases of damaged equipment. Defective equipment. I've had equipment come right out from the factory that's been defective and created an arc flash. Lack of maintenance is another big one here, not maintaining our equipment properly or improper maintenance. Contamination. Sometimes I work in high-tech firms where they have semiconductive dust that gets, gets brought into the equipment through the vents or through the fans inhaling that for cooling air brings in semiconductive dust, which can will conduct at some point in time, okay? Improper use of equipment. And also we have improper installations as well. One of the arc flash events that uh, I was exposed to that actually blew me off, it blew me back about 15 feet off a transformer, I fell on my back and I was burned from that event, was actually an improper installation. It was in violation of the National Electrical Code. So we can see the impacts and liabilities. The victim may not return to work, may have permanent psychological damages, or even beyond that, there could be a death. This can, these can be very painful injuries, and the expense can be significant. Now, it's not just the expense. The key thing is we can, we can impact someone for the rest of their life. In other words, if you see someone that's been burned significantly or know someone that's been burned significantly, if you've seen them throughout their life or maybe a period of their life, you will see that this will have a significant impact on their life in many cases, in most cases, in fact. So let's take a touch on the electrical safety codes and standards and some of the other codes and standards that we need to pay attention to. So proper installation and maintenance of electrical systems and equipment is essential for a safe facility and environment. Okay, so we have federal OSHA, Occupational Safety Health Administration, and state OSHA is applicable. So for an example, in Oregon and Washington, in many states, they run their own program underneath the federal OSHA umbrella. So they comply with the federal OSHA requirements, but they can go beyond those as necessary for the state OSHA program. We have NFPA 70, which is called the National Electrical Code, which guides the installation. So minimum installation requirements for a safe workplace to help avoid fires, to help avoid electrocutions and so forth, but doesn't get into specific work practices. We have state specialty code requirements. So in Oregon, for an example, or in Washington, the National Electrical Code is actually what is adopted, but with modifications. In other words, the state may add to or take away from the National Electrical Code requirements. So it's important we pay attention to those. We also have the National Electrical Safety Code when we get into power generation or substations. And then, of course, we've got multiple other standards. The rec NFPA 70B, Recommended Practice for Equipment Maintenance, so we can see how to maintain our equipment. We have NFPA 70E, Safety Related Maintenance Requirements, which just touches on safety. And we have other standards such as IEEE, NEMA, and NEDA, which all get into safe uh, maintenance requirements and so forth. These are very important for us to follow. So when we look at safety codes and importance of safety codes, Here's an example, and I could give you examples across the U.S., even some recently where a gentleman not too long ago died from saving his, his family from electrical shock in a swimming pool here in Texas. But here's a highly decorated Green Beret, Staff Sergeant Ryan Mathis. He died in, his, in the bathroom in Iraq. Now, here's a, a hero, and this is back in 2008, but he died in what should have been really the safest spot. And what happened is he reached up and grabbed the shower handle. They were getting shocked with the shower handles, and they actually were using wooden blocks to turn on the shower handle. Well, they shouldn't have been getting shocked off the shower handle. 
there was a there was several wiring errors. I actually met with some of the guys that went over and investigated this. Several wiring errors and misunderstandings in grounding and bonding, and he suffered the ultimate price for this. He paid the ultimate price and suffered in the process. He was electrocuted right in the shower. Okay. Now I've had folks that have attended my classes before, which have had near electrocution experience, major shock from wiring errors in facilities and in homes. So it's very, very important that we understand grounding and bonding and proper installation as per the codes. Now, in this case, the uh, contractor and the electricians, the whole thing was classified as negligent homicide because of the errors. In the case I just mentioned about the pool in Texas where the contractor did some work on it, didn't pull the permits, didn't wire it properly, okay, two electricians have been charged with negligent homicide because of the fact that they didn't wire it properly and a person died. So we can look at this NEC violation here. We have a circuit breaker not rated for the available fault current. So in other words, there's too much current flowing through it from the system when there's a fault downstream, whether a hot conductor, an energized conductor gets pinched to ground or phase to phase or phase to neutral. So in other words, if we have conductors that make connections that aren't supposed to be there and the device is not properly rated to interrupt that current, it can actually cause that device to explode, which is a hazard in itself. So that's one example. Many, many cases when we do studies, we find underrated equipment. And many times we talk to folks in our classes and find people are not aware of this requirement, this one requirement for the fault current rating of equipment. So here's just showing you an example here where we have uh, a ground wire that's actually, and I put my arrow right here, where the ground wire has been broken or a system bonding jumper that's been broken here. So the, the ground wire may be left off. It may be have a loose connection. For whatever reason, it's not having the proper current flow through there. So up here in the upper side here of that panel, we see there's a fault, let's say a phase to ground fault. The fault current is supposed to flow back up to the source. You can see the arrows there flow back up to the source through this wire, but the wire isn't there anymore. It's been broken or it's loose. So now the whole equipment can be energized and whoever comes up and touches that cabinet can receive electrical shock or worse yet be electrocuted. Where on the right side here, we see that that conductor's in place. It's solid, it's in good shape. So it provides a good solid fault current path back for the current to go back. And if everything's installed properly and functioning properly, the breaker should trip within let's say a couple cycles for a molded case or an insulated case breaker, which helps prevent electrical injury or worse yet. Okay, so that was just a couple examples from the NEC, but it's very important. There are a lot more we could give. Again, we just don't have time here today to go through all of them, but OSHA regulations, so we're going to touch on that. Electrical safety and arc flash. So OSHA regulations develop a mandate that employers provide a safe workplace for their employees. We have sections of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1910 and 26, promote the safety of employees working on or near equipment, and clearly define employers' responsibilities. We're just going to touch on a few of the sections. We don't have time to go through uh, nearly you know, a, a large section of these, but we're just going to touch on some of these. So I would suggest, too, is that you visit the federal and state OSHA websites for complete information and helpful documents. As I mentioned earlier, we have the OSHA.gov. Some states that, are, that may be listening on this webinar, you're under the federal OSHA program. Other states are going to be under the state OSHA program. So I've given you some links there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have, again, a list of links. And Beth will be sending that out as well. So let's just look at a couple of these. OK, subpart I, personal protective equipment. Use training, OK? So when we look at subpart I, it deals with personal protective equipment. What do I need to wear? What do I need to do to help protect myself? Not only against shock and arc flash, but there's all kinds of other things like safety glasses, hard hats, et cetera. So, but it's important we become familiar with the personal protective equipment requirements. Subpart J gets into general environmental controls, including general lockout, tag out. OK, subpart S, electrical wiring design, safe work practices. Now, electrical lockout tagout is specifically called out in 1910 subpart S. So if you have a general lockout tagout program and it doesn't include the provisions such as electrical hazards, testing for, you know, uh, confirmation of the system, you know, a zero energy state, you need to look at that subpart S in OSHA 1910, both or federal OSHA or state OSHA is applicable and include those requirements in your lockout tagout program. 
Of course, we also have special industries that we have, such as power generation, transmission, distribution, paper mills, sawmills, that have additional requirements. And subpart K, we won't really talk a lot about that today, but there are some very basic electrical safety requirements for construction as well. We also have NFPA 70E, the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. So chapters one, two, and three, we see we have work involving electrical hazards in chapter one, we're gonna focus there. Chapter two gives some very basic safety-related maintenance requirements. And three is safety requirements for special equipment, such as adjustable speed drives or battery rooms. The annex also includes reference publication, helpful information, okay, guides, sample procedures, documents, calculation methods for the hazards, okay, risk assessment, uh, guidelines and so forth, overhead line policies. And we're looking at the 2012 edition here. The 2015 was just released, which you'll wanna get a copy of at nfpa.org. And we'll have the link here again at the end of the presentation. But you'll wanna get a copy of the 2015. There are, some, there are some changes, especially in the tables dealing with personal protective equipment. So what can we do to help prevent injury? Well, first of all, we need to make sure our folks are trained. Are they aware of the hazards? So personnel who perform work on energized equipment, definitely, they need training on the hazards, the right type of PPE, um, how to avoid hazards, what safe work practices to use, okay? How about those other folks that are not doing electrical work, but they're exposed, they're working in the area, and they see the cabinet door open. Do they know to stay out of there? Do they know what that danger tape means? Okay, if uh, you have, let's say, someone doing janitorial work or outside work, let's say uh, cutting, you know, they're out there cutting uh, a hedge with an electric hedge clipper, do they know about the equipment grounding conductor requirements? Do they know to use ground fault circuit interrupters? So it's not just those doing electrical work. And on the right side, we can see that OSHA states that there are certain types of occupations or occupational categories and employees facing a higher than normal risk of electrical accidents. And they've given some examples down there below which require electrical safety training. Now that would be relative to their job. If we're training, if someone's outdoor, outdoors doing maintenance work outdoors on let's say uh, landscaping, they're not gonna have to be trained on how to get inside electrical equipment of course and work on it. But they do need to be aware of the hazards that they might face and how to uh, see those hazards, understand them, recognize them and avoid them. So let's look at OSHA subpart S. What is a qualified person? Okay, so a qualified person, one who has received training in and has demonstrated skills and knowledge in the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installations and the hazards involved. So do you see a key word there? Or maybe a couple keywords. I've got them underlined there, demonstrated skills and knowledge. Now I've had folks in my classes before and in audits that we've done where they had taken short video clip trainings and they had enough short term memory that at the end of the video training that they could check off the box. In other words, they could pass the quiz at the end of the training, the 10-minute training, but they couldn't apply it in the field. That was obvious when we audited the program. They didn't understand enough to apply it in the field. So are your folks not only able to receive training, but able to demonstrate safe work practices, the skills and knowledge necessary? Okay, so now note one to the definition of a qualified person down there, whether an employee is considered to be a qualified person will depend on various circumstances. Now, we have some people that may be qualified to work on some equipment, but not qualified to work on others. It's very important that people understand their qualifications and when to say no. Now, there's also training requirements for a qualified person, both in OSHA, so you can see OSHA 1910-332-B3, and NFPA 70E, the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. It's very important that we inspect our equipment. So we need to properly inspect our equipment, check cords, outlets, and electrical equipment for damage, wiring errors. So if we have GFCIs, as you can see in the, the picture in the upper right-hand corner there, and also the uh, lower, the bottom of the slide here, we have a GFCI that would be used, let's say, for a construction site or a site where we may be doing electrical maintenance. If we look at these, let's say right on the GFCI there for the construction site or the site where we're doing electrical maintenance on, uh, it says test, for, test on it before each use. Right on the button it says test before each use. So are we testing these things? In your home, when is the last time you tested the GFCI by pushing the test button? If you look at the receptacle or the instructions, which I 
really ask you to do, but in many cases it may say test monthly, or please follow the manufacturer's recommendations if they give a different test schedule. Now, up here in this picture, we can see here's a little receptacle and GFCI tester. Not only used to test the GFCI, it has a little test button there, the yellow test button, but it also has lights on there to tell me whether my receptacle is wired properly. I bet a lot of folks have GFCIs in, especially the older ones which were miswired. You could miswire them and they would not trip during an event when tested. So it's very important. We test our receptacles to make sure they're wired properly. If they're not, then we need to get someone that's qualified out to correct those issues. So GFCI is very important for personnel protection. Here we can see we have some examples of cords. In the upper right-hand corner with a couple white arrows up there, we have two wire cords. And you can see one blade is wider than the other. It's very important that we maintain proper polarity. If you go by a, a saw or something that's only a two-wire cord, should it have been a three-wire cord? If it has a metal case, obviously it needs an equipment grounding conductor. Even some devices with plastic cases need that equipment grounding conductor. Now, if someone flips the hot and the neutral, the black and the white wire, which you can't see black and white, but if you were able to picture it that way, the blade, the wider blade there should be the white wire. In other words, if I was to put the cord, a new cord cap on a toaster and flip it the wrong way, and I have the toaster plugged into a wall, let's say it's not a GFCI protected receptacle, okay, which is going to help protecting its shock, but if someone reached down in that toaster with a fork, which they shouldn't do, of course, but they touch one of those elements, and even with the toaster off, if the polarity of the cord is reversed, they would be exposed to an energized conductor, where it's less likely, if the polarity is correct, that they would be exposed to that. The picture down below it here, we can see that the ground pin is missing. Where the red arrow is, the ground pin is missing. So anything, any kind of fault, in equipment, portable equipment, or anything that we use where that ground pin is missing. And some of you may even have an older home where you may buy something that actually has a three-wire cord, but yet you only have a two-wire receptacle. Now here, this, this adapter is designed to that, you see the little green arrow there, where that tab is folded down and actually goes underneath the screw that holds a receptacle plate on, assuming there is a ground to the junction box that holds that receptacle. That's a big if, because many systems were not grounded. Many times people don't even bend that tab down. So how would I know? I would have to either call a qualified electrician, or I would have to hook this up and use a receptacle tester at the very minimum to make sure it's grounded. Otherwise, if I use one of those adapters here, I'm setting myself up for electrical shock. Okay, so let's look here for product recalls. When is the last time, if you use a meter or your folks use test equipment or meters, when is the last time you look for recalls on those meters? There are several pieces of test equipment that are out there that are under recall. So I want to go to the cpsc.gov, and I can actually sign up for updates, new items that are under recall to get announcements on. But consumerproductsafetycouncil.gov for meter recalls, for, in this case, there's surge suppressors that are creating fire hazards. In some cases, there are light bulbs, LED light bulbs that were sold that were creating fire hazards. So would it be good to understand and know which pieces of equipment are being recalled? Absolutely. Okay, so when we look at other protective equipment and, and precautions for personnel activities. We should be wearing proper protective equipment, let's say if we're opening up gear, so we have what's called personal protective equipment for shock and arc flash hazards. But one of the things that we don't want to do is create the hazard to begin with. So one of the things I see violated a lot is if you have a circuit breaker or you have a fusible disconnect where you have a, it's like a switch with fuses in it, if the fuse blows or the breaker trips, you are not to reset that unless you know it can be done safely. Now, if you had an overload, like a motor was jammed up and we've cleared the overload and we know the overload caused the breaker to trip or the fuses to blow, yes, we can reset it if we know we can do it safely. But let's say downstream we had a phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground fault. So actually at a direct fault condition, you close that breaker, put fuses in and reclose back into that fault, the breaker can actually explode on you, okay? Or you can damage the breaker severely. So this is an OSHA and an NFPA 70E, is we cannot reset a breaker unless we know it can be done safely. We can't just keep reclosing, keep reclosing the breaker into that fault condition. Generally, circuit breakers are only rated to clear a fault at their 
full fault current rated value two times before they need to be replaced. Okay, so let's look at responsibilities. Safety related work practices provided by the employer, safety related training provided by the employer, but do the employees have a responsibility? Absolutely. So the employees are responsible for participating in this. We try and get the employees active. If you're here, and I know we have some folks from the environmental health and safety that are on the line, it's it's absolutely essential that you get your folks to participate in this. Why? Because if I'm wearing your hat from environmental health and safety, I have fall protection, I have chemicals, I have you know, confined space. There's just too many areas to be subject matters, to be a subject matter expert in. That's why we only focus on electrical. That's all, that's all the width that we can handle is the electrical side. It's very important that you get your folks involved on your team to help you develop the safety programs, the guidelines and policies and procedures that are necessary. So employees shall be involved with the whole process from my perspective. It's mandatory that they participate and they have ownership in that process. So an electrical safety program, the employer shall implement and document an overall safety program that directs activity appropriate for the hazards, the voltage that they could be exposed to, the energy level and circuit conditions. So depending on when we're looking at this, we, again, have to have something in writing. What are my employees, do they know what to do? Well, I say follow OSHA and follow 70E. Is that telling them enough? Are they supposed to read all of OSHA and 70 and memorize it? Or do I need to have something that tells them what our policy is at our company? Okay, yes, absolutely. What is our policy? And by the way, if you say you're following 70E, please read it carefully before you, you make a blanket statement, okay? Fed OSHA and the state OSHA programs, they have not mandated 70E. It's absolutely important for you to know 70E to try and comply with it, but there may be some areas where you want to do something a little different than what exactly 70E calls for and still achieve the same results. So also when we look at a safety program, risk and hazard reduction and elimination should be a key part. In other words, it's not about just putting the PPE on, personal protective equipment on. It's about how do we avoid it. And you can see down here in the lower right-hand corner, this is a device that actually mounts right on the front of a cabinet, allows you to bring out certain functions in the cabinet right to the front of the door so I don't even have to open it up. For an example, if I wanted to plug into a PLC and that's all I have to do in the cabinet, why open up that cabinet if there's 40 volts live exposed in that cabinet of energized conductors? Why not just, why not just uh, be able to have that information plug into the PLC external to the cabinet. Lockout, tagout. Equipment must be de-energized before work is performed. So we look at this in addressing work on electrical equipment, 1910-333A1 states live parts to which an employee may be exposed shall be de-energized before the employee works on or near them and unless the employer can demonstrate that de-energizing introduces additional or increased hazards or is infeasible due to equipment design or operational limitations. So in summary, what are they saying? Shut it off. What's the safest way to work on anything? To turn it off. So there are some exceptions to that, okay, to, to turning parts off such as testing and troubleshooting, okay, but we're not gonna go into all those. Please look at the OSHA requirements and look at the exceptions to that. OSHA subpart S, again, if equipment cannot be de-energized prior to work, then employees must be properly protected. So when employees are required to work where there is a potential hazard, what does 1910.335 call for? It calls for the employer to provide electrical protective equipment that's appropriate for the specific parts of the body to be protected and the work to be performed. Now notice, if we look at the appendix to 1910 subpart S, so we have a little box down below, it tells you to refer to 70E as providing information that can be helpful in complying. Now you notice this is what, what I would call one of their blanket requirements. They don't go into a lot of detail about the requirements here. They're telling you though, that you have to do something. If there's a hazard, which are flash, shock, thermal burn, or hazards, then you have to do something about it. Do they say specifically what you have to do? No, it's up to you to make the decision. It's up to you to assess the risk and come up with a game plan on how to protect yourself or your folks. And again, 70E can be very helpful in doing it along with the OSHA requirements. When I look at subpart I, personal protective equipment, employers are responsible for performing a hazard assessment. So it states that employers shall assess the workplace to determine if hazards are present or likely to be present, which necessitate the use of PPE. So it's very important that you understand how to assess the hazards, and you do what's called a hazard slash risk assessment, where you're looking, what are the voltages that my folks are exposed to? What is the potential for shock? Is everything covered up? 
What is the energy level in that cabinet or in that electrical switch gear? What type of PPE do they need to do, wear, or what do they need to do to protect themselves to avoid even the exposure to this type of hazard? These are all things when we look at the hazard assessment and the risk assessment. Okay, if such hazards are present and likely to be present, the employer shall select and have each affected employee use the types of PPE to protect the affected employee from the hazards, communicate those decisions, select PPE that properly fits each employee, so size 4XL is not gonna work for everyone, provide training and documentation on the selection, application, and use of PPE. So again, whose role is this? Again, the employer is involved with the risk assessment along with the employees, but folks need to be under, they need to understand their PPE, how to pick it, how to wear it, et cetera. So when we look at this, we also need to look at the shock and arc flash boundaries. We don't have time to go into those today, but that's, in other words, how close can I get? At what point does the PPE have to go on to avoid shock? At what point does the PPE have to go on to avoid, to avoid injury from arc flash? So we need to look at shock hazards and the boundaries, arc flash hazards and their boundaries. We need to look at risk and hazard reduction, equipment labeling so they understand the hazards and how to read the labels, how to pick their PPE properly. So these are all parts of the risk assessment. So if we don't have a study done, if we haven't had someone come in and actually calculate the incident energy levels and conduct that, we can actually use what's called the table method in NFPA 70E. So again, I would suggest if you don't have a copy, you can also view NFPA 70E free online at nfpa.org. So if you go on to nfpa.org, you can actually look at the NFPA 70E standard free online. You can't print it or copy it, but you can actually look at it. So there's many other important items, okay? We have energized work permits, job briefings, risk assessments, insulated tools, all kinds of other things on here, risk reduction. And I've shown some examples down below here, making sure we have the right ladders, the right tools, the right type of electrical gear, the right type of meters, that we have work permits. Too many things to cover today, okay? But just realize that we just touched on the tip of the iceberg here. So it's very important that we become familiar with all these things. So the question is, where are you at with your program? So I've given you kind of a checklist here. Now we will send out a checklist as well. So even though you have a checklist here on the slide, go down through the checklist and see where you're at with your program and see how you measure up. This may help you decide kind of a gap analysis. Where are you at today? Where do you need to go to? So where are you at with your safety program? If you would just take a minute and kind of indicate maybe where you're at, if you feel comfortable doing that, okay? So we have some folks just starting, some in progress, okay? It could be a daunting process. I mean, it can be kind of intimidating, but again, start. The thing is start, don't wait. Get started, there are resources available in the industry. So great, we've got some people in great shape, others just starting, some in progress. So thank you for that feedback. So here's a few industry resources. And again, we'll send out a link here. We have federal and state OSHA, and there's lots of guidelines and helpful information on the OSHA websites, the state and federal OSHA website. Again, NFPA 70, Standard for Electrical Safety Workplace. We have the Electrical Safety Foundation. Portland General Electric has some great information on safety, including power line safety. There is an upcoming PGE-sponsored half-day safety awareness seminar for supervisors, managers, environmental health and safety professionals. So if you want additional awareness on the hazards, again, this is a four-hour class upcoming. Uh, Beth will be sending out some information on that. PGE also sponsors full-day training as well on electrical safety. And there's a, a range of industry trainers and consultants that are available to you. So to recap, electrical shock and arc flash can cause serious injury or death. Okay, electrical safety is necessary, is taking the necessary steps to avoid work or injury due to electrical hazards. Injuries are preventable, resources are available. Develop a game plan and get started. And over on the right side, you'll see an example from a hierarchy of health and safety controls. Usually it's using a host of these. In other words, it's not just one of these. The best way is to eliminate the hazard. The kind of the bottom, the bottom of the rung here, the least effective is putting PPE on, just saying, hey, if something happens, I'm gonna use my PPE. We never wanna be exposed to the hazards. Usually it's a combination of all six of these items that are used to help protect personnel against injury. So with that, um, 
I've got a slide here showing you some energy uh, resources that are available to you. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Beth. Thank you, Gary. I just wanted to uh, point out the energy efficiency resources that Gary uh, mentioned here on the slide. PG and the Energy Trust provide free consultations by phone or on site to help you identify energy savings opportunities at your facility. And the contact numbers you'll see here are divided up in between our commercial customers and our industrial customers. And you'll receive this information in the PDF um, of the slides and the uh, recording that you'll receive in a couple of days. And if you're not with PGE, uh, please contact your local utility for this information. And before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind everyone that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat, and I'll ask them of Gary. And um, let's see, Gary, our first question is, we have a lockout tagout procedure in place, and we work on most items with the equipment powered down. Do we still need arc flash protective gear? Great question, Beth. A uh, couple things on that. I, I heard you say most, and I'm not sure if they meant most, but that means there's still energized work being done. So yes, PPE is required for energized work. But even if we shut things down under lockout tagout, until we verify that the equipment is de-energized, there's no shock or arc flash hazards, all the PPE has to go on to perform the testing until we verify we're in zero energy state. Great, thank you, Gary. And our next question, is uh, our electrical equipment technicians also required to have training and protective equipment, or is this only for electricians? Uh, another great question. Anybody that's exposed to potential hazards, have to, they have to have the training and the PPE that's necessary relative to their So if the technicians are opening up cabinets where we have hazards, shock or arc flash or thermal hazard, thermal burn hazard, then if the appropriate PPE is required, a risk assessment has to be done, folks have to be trained on it, et cetera. Thank you, Gary. And it looks like we have one more question, and that is um, typically the only work we do on energized equipment is troubleshooting. Is PPE required for troubleshooting equipment? Uh, yes. Personal protective equipment is required for troubleshooting equipment. In fact, a lot of people get injured testing and troubleshooting. So it's very important we understand we have the right meters, the right test equipment, the folks are trained properly, and that they know how to pick their, their test equipment and their personal protective equipment for the houses involved. Again, a lot of people get hurt testing and troubleshooting because you're typically in there making contact with the meter, with test leads, you're working inside. And if you're troubleshooting, it means there's something wrong in that cabin or something malfunctioning, which is a raised probability that we are exposed to the hazards. So, yes, the answer is yes, PPE is required. Thank you, Gary. And that was our last question. And I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us today.